Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Bryant, and I'll be your host for this webinar. Please make sure your microphones and web cameras are disabled during the presentation to provide a smooth webinar. During the webinar, if you have technical difficulties, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You're welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments and insights. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our upcoming webinars are on January 22nd, Wednesday at 4 p.m., Germans and American Church Records with Dr. Roger Minert, and January 31st, Friday at 4 p.m., Immigration and Naturalization with Susan Hoffman. If you would like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates for our Facebook and Twitter, Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from James Tanner, who will be giving a presentation who will be giving a presentation on discovering the in unindexed records in the Family Search catalog. James Tanner has over 32 years of experience in genealog genealogical research and is an avid blogger of genealogies, Star Blog, and Rejoice. And rejoice and be exceedingly glad. He has presented at expos and conferences around the US and Canada. He serves for 10 years. He served for 10 years as a missionary at the Mesa, Arizona Family Search Library and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. James has seven children and 34 grandchildren and one great grandchild. If James is ready, we will turn the time over to him. Great. Uh, this is James Tanner. We're here again for another video, video from uh, uh, the BYU Family History Library on BYU campus in Provo, Utah. And we have a cold and windy and very snowy day today. We are, uh, this is part of the BYU Family History Library series of which is being published on the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. So all these are, are available for free on the channel, plus a lot of other shorter videos, uh, instructional videos uh, that are prepared by the missionary staff here at the BYU Family History Library. Today, we're going to talk about discovering the unindexed records in the Family Search catalog. This is a, a very interesting topic because uh, a lot of the people who will use the FamilySearch.org website are unaware of the fact that many of the records, and we'll see the, the exact numbers, uh, current numbers, are, of, are not available when you do a search. So we'll talk about that as we go along, as I go along here and, and explain what happens. On the right, on the left side of the screen, you'll see a, a screenshot of the Family Search catalog. It's available uh, from the menu bar uh, under the search menu, which is the, the high menu item at the top of the screen of Family Search. And then uh, the selections are across the screen. Once you select uh, one of the items, in this case, the catalog, so you have records, family tree, genealogies, catalog, books, and wiki. Uh, we do have videos on each of those subjects, and uh, if you're interested, you, go, you can go to the YouTube channel and find out more about each of the titles there. And we will probably have more in the future since there's always something new or something left to be said about each of those subjects. Uh, kind of move ahead here a little bit. So as of November 2019, um, the number of digital images published in the Family Search's historic record collections online was 1.4 billion records. Uh, a little bit of explanation about that term, records. Um, the big online uh, genealogical database programs, such as Family Search, uh, Ancestry, My Heritage, uh, Find My Past, uh, and other websites that have lots and lots of records, 
uh, interestingly count all their records differently. Everybody counts them their way, their own personal way. So what is a record on one website doesn't necessarily reflect what is a record on another website. Uh, and they also uh, bear little relationship to the number of actual individuals available to be searched. So the number on, a, on one record, uh, if it were a, uh, uh, say, a birth or, or death record or some kind of a census record, you may have as many as 50 or more people listed on one record, on one sheet of paper that, that we would call a record. Uh, in, the other, in another sense, at the other end of the spectrum, you could have one name on one record. Uh, for instance, um, a World War II uh, draft registration card is like one name of the person who, who actually registered. And that could be considered to be a record. So having record numbers doesn't really give you an idea of how many people uh, are in those records. And unless the uh, idea is uh, th that there's some relationship between that. So you'll hear the title from different uh, websites. You'll hear about records, images, uh, people, uh, uh, all sorts of different terms used for showing uh, a relative sizes. Uh, 1.4 billion is a lot. Uh, so we can say, yeah, we have a whole lot of digital images on uh, on the family search website and they are very valuable for finding people in various parts of the world uh, family searches collections in the catalog include uh, some pretty primarily important records from the united states uh, a lot of records from the united states uh, even historical records going back to colonial times and uh, a fair number of records from a lot of other countries uh, a very, very uh, good representation of records from, from Latin America, from Mexico, Central America, South America, and a lot of records from Europe and a lot of records from the British Isles and a few other records sprinkled around the world. Uh, and in the names of millions, millions of records from, uh, from other places uh, around the world. So it's, it's uh, a very valuable website. But the answer to this is it's sort of like a, um, well, it's not really like an iceberg because icebergs are supposed to have some percentage below water and above water. But in this case, if we go to uh, the number of digital images published only in the family search catalog, then we come up with more right now and more recently, this number it now exceeds the number of digital images published in the Family Search's historic record collections. So we have two separate places on the, they're not really two separate places, but there's two ways of looking at the records. The problem is that one way through the Family Search historical record collections is you only are viewing primarily records that have been indexed. That means that the, the volunteers who are assisting Family Search and in indexing all these billions of records um, have done uh, the, that many records. And we'll show you there are some limitations even on that characterization, as I will show in just a couple of minutes. But the other part of it is this is the kind of unseen part of the li of the uh, collection, and that is the catalog, which is the family search catalog that I showed a screenshot of initially. And those are the digital image that are published only in the catalog, meaning they are not available if you do a search in the historic record collections. So let me explain how this works if you're to coming to the website. So if you come to familysearch.org and you sign in and you go to the historical record collections to look for one of your ancestors or a family or whatever, and you put in the name and you search, first of all, understanding that you're only going to be searching indexed records. That means records that somebody volunteer, some volunteer someplace has looked at and extracted the names and whatever information goes into the index. So if you find your person, that's because somebody indexed the record. But traditionally in genealogy, 
uh, we didn't have that opportunity. There were indexes of some records. The indexes have been around for a long time, uh, long before the internet, long before we had digitization, all of that. An index is something like the index at the back of a book or the index that was made to records just manually done by people who created the records. Um, there are many records, a lot of, for instance, Catholic church records, the priests for their own convenience would index the records, go through and make a listing at the beginning of the of each of the parish register books of all the people that were in the books, just so they could find them, not because of any reason that they thought anybody else could use that. So those are sometimes available and sometimes very, very useful. But this, what we're talking about here is a systematic uh, volunteer effort by, uh, sponsored by Family Search to work through all these records and index with different categories of indexing, depending on the records, obviously, uh, for each and every record in the collection. Now, this is the, this, what these numbers show you is that the unindexed records now exceed the number of index records by quite a margin here, by, by many uh, hundreds of thousands of records. Plus, this number on, on the digital images published only in the catalog is growing quite rapidly. The number of indexed records is also growing, but not as rapidly. So over time, it's probable that you will see the number of digital images only go up for a period of time until either the technology catches up and indexing becomes much faster and much more uh, uh, complete than if uh, the records. Oh, say, what limits this? A very simple thing. For example, um, uh, digitized records uh, are, are very readable to humans, but not so read readable to computers. Uh, we have OCR, which is optical character recognition technology, which will read typed or printed records. But with handwriting, that's still uh, kind of an elusive idea out there that we could read handwriting going back uh, many hundreds of years. There's some systems that are getting better and better and better at it, but it's still not there at the, at the point where we're using that. So this is the limitation. The limitation is uh, where are all of these records that are not indexed and how do we get to those records? That's the idea here that we're talking about today. So now if we were going to search this historical records here, and we're into the historical record collection. Um, this is what you would do. You could put in your ancestor's name and uh, there's some options for adding marriage, birth, res birth, marriage, residence, death, uh, search, add spouse, most more information. And there's uh, techniques for learning, for maximizing uh, these searches on the, on the, uh, in the historical record collections. But let's suppose that you were searching for a name and or a, a type of record. So you can also go down in the, uh, in the bottom over there uh, and uh, using the historical record collections, you can browse to all the published collections. Okay, what does that mean? It means you can see each of the areas where the records, uh, where there are records for a uh, specific geographical area. Um, it's, it's important to understand, and I'll repeat this a couple of times, I'm sure, is that everything we do in genealogy turns out to be geographically based. Uh, you may think you're searching for the name of your ancestor, but unless you have a pretty good idea where that ancestor lived, and I'll repeat this also, but uh, I'll say it to begin with, and that is know the exact location of an event in your ancestor's life, it's probable that you're going to have a lot of duplicates out there to, to go through and you may not be able to find which one of those people is really your ancestor. So this is kind of the key to the whole idea is, is uh, that's G and that's why these records are, are for the most part, uh, uh, geographically organized. That doesn't mean the only way that you can research them, but it is the major and the default way that comes up when you search for records. So here, if you look at the historical record collections list, so you have a list of all these different records, and uh, you have the option to filter out the records by title. So you could kind of find out if a record is even in the collection 
by looking at that, uh, by putting in a, a, a location or filtering out with all the filters that are on the uh, left-hand side of this uh, screenshot here. But here we're going to put in a uh, physical location, a geographic location, so we can look further into the records. In this case, we're going to look for records in Mexico. <clears throat> and the places where we're going to look is in for Mexico, Guanajuato, Catholic Church records from 1519 to 1984. And um, I think the record thing is being covered by a little shrink. I don't know if that's, we'll get rid of that thing smaller. If that was covering up what's happening here. Um, in the, on the Mexico Guanajuato records, you'll see it says in the historical record collections that there are 1,481,850 records. That's what it says. It was last updated in 2017. And uh, there are civil registration records, which were a little bit newer. And there's a couple of million, almost 3 million of those. So there's a lot of records here. But the question is, ooh, there is a problem here because uh, there's nothing specific that shows you on this screen that this, that this number, of what this number is. And in effect, this number for this is actually that 1,481,000, the number of indexed records. So how many records are there actually in this collection of Mexico Catholic Church records from Guanajuato, a state in Mexico for that time period? And the answer is, well, we have to look a little bit further. So we look here, the actual number of records, if we click on the collection name and look at the records, the actual number is view the images in this collection, which is at the bottom of this screenshot. And if you look there, and that number is a little bit higher than the number that was in the record. So in this case, when you're searching by name, you're only searching the number of indexed records. And that's the case with all the records on family search. So you need to be aware of that fact. And these are the numbers. There were, as according to that first screenshot, 1,481,850 images that was the number of indexed records, <coughs> and 4,584,983 images, which means only about a fourth of all the images were being searched for the name of your person. Okay, now what does that mean? Uh, it means that there's a whole lot more information in family search than you are finding if you do a name search. That's basically what it is. So if you go in and put it in the name of your family, Jose Martinez or whatever, if you were looking in those Mexican records, you would find a lot of Jose Martinez people, but you'd also be missing about three out of four of them because you would be missing all of, all of the records that were unindexed as of yet. That's why indexing is so important. It's, it's, it's really primarily important uh, and, and what happens. Now, what does this really mean to someone who has been doing genealogy for a long time? Well, what it means is there are, that indexing is a, is a major convenience. It's a major advantage, but it really doesn't help ultimately in making a decision about whether or not the record exists and whether or not you can find that a particular person in those records. So what you really need to do is look at all of those four and a half million plus records or images and see what you have seen. And how do you do that? Guess what? It's page by page, step by step. There are some more different levels of indexing in those records. Like I said, some of the Catholic priests index their own records. Uh, and in this, and when I'm talking about these records, go clear out to all the records. So basically you go through the same process. If you look at what's the, the number of records that is listed in the historical record collections, and then you look at the page for those records, click on the record itself and look at that page, it will tell you the number of images available. If those two figures are the same, then every record in that collection has 
been indexed. If those records, if those numbers are different, the difference is the number of in it, unindexed records that exist in that particular collection. So that's, and I, uh, I've explained this to lots of people and I can't come up with any kind of a simpler way of finding, of, uh, of talking about it. So where are these records? Where are all of these different records that are listed, listed in the catalog? Well, they're in the catalog. And so there's a difference here. The, the catalog has all the records. It has a reference to every record. Now that doesn't mean they're all indexed. It doesn't mean you can find the names in there without searching record by record. But what it does mean is that every, every record in family search is found in the catalog. Now, how about if I qualify that now that I've already said that? Part of that is understanding also that we that family search has a few hundred thousand books online and they're totally digitized and uh, readable. And in a lot of cases, you can even download a, a copy of the book if you wish. But those books and the contents of those books are not directly searchable from the historical record collections either. So you have to go to the books collection, which is one of the things listed on that initial uh, menu bar that I uh, that I was referencing in the early and when we started this uh, this particular presentation. So there's different places uh, on Family Search to look. Uh, primarily, though, the records that we're concerned with, you're going to find everything in the catalog and uh, links from the catalog to the records if the records are not particularly books. Okay, so in the catalog, you're going to have all the books that are in the Family uh, History Library in Salt Lake City, in addition to uh, the, all the microfilm and all of the digital images that have, were, that have been created since they began digitizing rather than doing microfilm. All of that's going to be in the catalog, but the uh, books, for example, unless they're in the books collection, are not going to be clickable. They're simply going to be there and give you a call number, which tells you where the book is on the shelf in the Family History Library in Salt Lake City. Now, we're here in, in uh, Provo at the BYU Family History Library, which happens to be the second largest family history library in the world after the one in Salt Lake City. And uh, the, we use the catalog to find out uh, if we have a particular microfilm or uh, access to a book here at the library in B, at BYU. And the Family History Library is catalog. And we look up a microfilm there, and then we put the number in that we find for the microfilm number into the catalog search engine here at the Family History Library, and that will tell you whether that or not that particular microfilm is available here at BYU. Now, there are still a few microfilms that are only, av only available as microfilm. That means that those particular microfilms have yet to be digitized. So their images are not in the catalog, but the microfilm number and the role of microfilm is available in the catalog. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the worldwide uh, shipping of, of microfilms out to family history centers ended some years ago. And uh, the, if, if you find an, a microfilm that is yet to be digitized, you can basically request that it be digitized by Family Search, and they may do that in some point in the future. But uh, the other option is to come to the Family History Library in Salt Lake, or if it turns out that the that that microfilm is also available, the BYU Family History Library, that you could come to the BYU Family History Library and see the same microfilm if it still had yet to be digitized. Um, so that's kind of the, that's the summary. So the records as such are either digitized or on the shelf in the Family History Library in Salt Lake City or not on the shelf, which is another problem. 
And that is that as, as the items are digitized, in many cases, they're removed from the shelves they're, because there's lots of, only limited shelf space and there's lots of things they would like to put on the shelves or lots of areas they would like to use for that, for that era, uh, for that, for other purposes. And so um, the records themselves uh, are still available and may be available uh, online, but may not be physically available uh, today uh, at the Family History Library in Salt Lake City. So there are microfilm records that would not be either at BYU or available, readily available in, in, uh, in Salt Lake at the Family History Library, the main Family History Library. If that sounds confusing enough, then uh, there probably are, there are some other little categories out there that, you, uh, that I'm not gonna have time to cover today uh, of records that are not available generally in either place. <laughs> so it's just, uh, it's, it's kind of very interesting that there are some things out there that uh, you need to do some searching and asking uh, to find. By and large, the, the summary of this would be that everything that you can imagine, uh, generally speaking, in finding records on family search are able to be accessed through the catalog or the digitized book collections. Those are the two places you would want to look for access to the records. Now, what happens if you get a notice that says this record is restricted? Sometimes you get a little uh, icon that'll say it's restricted. And um, that restricted records mean that you actually have to be in the library or in the Family History Library in Salt Lake or in the BYU Library or another family history center to view the records. So they're only viewable on our computer that's sitting uh, hooked up to the family history library or family history center uh, called portal or directly to the uh, to family search. So there are still some records that are unavailable even under those circumstances. So we're now going to turn to the catalog itself. And the Family Search catalog is, uh, as I mentioned previously very briefly, is primarily geographically organized. Now, what does that mean? It means that um, you find records in the catalog organized by the geographical area in which the records were originally created or the way they were cataloged with the records as originally created. Okay, so what kind of records are we talking about? Well, let's, let's take an example, a couple examples. I'll just do some examples around the world and this will give you an idea of how the catalog is organized. First of all, we have records like an Amer uh, US census record starting in 1790, uh, 1800, 1810, every, every 10 years. The, the decennial census is the ones that come out every 10 years. Okay, so a 10-year census records in the United States, with the exception of the 1890 census, which was uh, burned and then uh, thrown away by the government. Um, that Those records are, uh, are easily found under United States. They are categorized geographically. If you click on the United States, you'll come up with a list of records. If you further filter that to look for census records, you'll find a list of all of the uh, census records that are presently available up through 1940 uh, that are all digitized and indexed. So everything's there searchable, everything's there online, and you can view the original census records uh, for, uh, for the different census schedules as they were, as they're in the catalog. So well, there's no reason to go to any to the library. There's no reason you can go at your own computer from FamilySearch.org, go to the catalog, uh, go to uh, the historical record collections, and find all of the indexed U.S. Census records. Okay, if you were to jump over to Europe, you would find all of the British Census records, if beginning in 1841. Um, digitized and searchable. Um, that isn't the only web, in fact, Family Search is not the only website that has these records. There are other websites that have 
collections of the census records and uh, from both the United States and from Great Britain, from England, Scotland, and Wales primarily. So those are some examples of, of how the kinds of records that you would find uh, if you were looking for uh, civil registration records in Italy, you could find it under Italy. If you were looking for church records in Scandinavia, then you would find them under the countries, under Norway, Sweden, Denmark, etc. So these are the records that you would find. These are the records that would be located uh, by geographically by that. Um, it, in a sense, there's an interesting part of it is that the catalog itself helps you understand the kinds of records that might be available. So in a sense, it's a teaching aid because it, it educates you on all the different kinds of records that are available because they are, are, are organized geographically and then by type of record. So they're cataloged then by rec the type of record. And uh, so you would search for each record, not only geographically, but also by the way the record is organized. Now, in order for this to be useful to you in your genealogical research, and for you to actually find any information that might be helpful for, your, for discovering your family, you need to know the exact location of at least one event in your ancestors' lives. So what does that mean? Well, it means that a reference to a John Brown who lived in England is not helpful, does not give you any information that will help you find this person. Why? Obvious. The Brown name is extremely common. John is one of the most common or, or the most common English surname. And if you're looking in England for John Brown, you will find hundreds of thousands of perhaps even millions of people historically in the records of the, of the websites that have that name. But if you knew, if you were speaking of John Brown born in a specific parish, like a parish in England, a division of the Church of England, on a specific date or even in a, in a date range like a year, specific year or series of years, your chances of finding that person increase, you know, tremendously because the number of people that would have that same name in that same location associated with a general date or even a specific date would be far, far less. You may even get down to the same one person, depending on the name. But even with, with a very common name, you may end up with three or four or five or maybe more people, but that's a lot easier than a million. And <clears throat> so in every case, these re the records, in order to locate records that are accurate, you really know, need to know the exact location of at least one event. Once you know that, then you're ready to start looking for records that may have been correct, may have been um, available at that time. So here's the definition of the genealogically valuable records. Those are records that were created at or near the time of an event in your ancestor's life and that were recorded by someone who witnessed the event or was, was had some kind of responsibility for recording the, re the event. And so it, those are the records that we're looking for. And the catalog is arranged in a way that helps you find those records once you know that basic information about your ancestor. And most people start with kind of the major events in a person's life, birth, marriage, and death, and look for those items. And then when you find a place where the people were married or where they were born or where they died, then there's a way to start looking for records and there's, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem because, you know, you have to know the place, but in order to find the place, you have to find the person. And in order to find the person, you have to know the place. It goes like that. But it's, it, you know, it, it, the way the catalog is organized and the way that you do research will eventually give you that information. Because what are you going to do? You're going to start with yourself 
And if you don't know where you were born and you don't know where you got married, then you probably have some problems that aren't going to help you anyway. Um, so better, the idea here is that you basically start with the people where you know that information and you work outward to people that you uh, do not know the information for. And the rule is simple. The rule is the first rule of genealogy. And that is that when the baby was born, the mother was there. So if I know that I was born in where in the location of my birth, then I can assume the mother was there. And if my, I don't assume it, I can guarantee that my mother was there. And basically, once I know that information, then I can start looking for my mother's records in that location. Okay, that's the whole idea here. And this is the way the catalog is set up. It's, a, it's a, uh, an analog in a sense of what, you uh, the way that uh, that records and the and the world is is operate and so you can actually think about where the location was that it happened and then you can go to that location and find listings of all the records that the family search catalog has for that particular area and you, then you can go ahead and search those records okay so here we go this is how we get in there to start doing that so first of all, we click on search. We go down to the catalog. We open the catalog. We type in a place. In this case, we're going to type in Mexico. And then we go down and click on Mexico. And the next thing that happens is we come up with the records for Mexico. Now, you're going to have to do a lot of clicking here. The catalog is organized in layers. so. Every time you click, you're going to get down to a, another layer in the catalog. It goes down. Um, uh, if, we, if you were thinking in terms of visually, uh, you're walking from one area of, this, of the book stacks in a library to another area, and you keep going to new areas as you get more specific information about the records you're looking for. So you're doing the same thing by clicking down in the menus in the family search catalog. So here's what happens when you get Mexico listing. Uh, you get a lot of, of different categories. Now, what I said a moment ago was that these categories of records are uh, didactic. They will teach you the kinds of records that are generally available. So as you look at the records in the catalog, you'll see the records that you can search. In other words, there are all sorts of records here. This is listing everything from archives and libraries to church records to uh, col colonial colonialization records, court records, uh, directories, immigration and emigration, all kinds of records that are available to search. And part of the process of learning how to do genealogy is understanding what all these different records are. So part of what you learn when you become a genealogist is where the records are and what kinds of things you could find in those records. So you know whether or not that is going to be a, something that's going to be helpful in locating your ancestor. But I said a moment ago that you're going to have to click down through and you'll see up at the top of this screen, it's probably pretty hard to read, but it says places within Mexico. And there's a little one of the arrows, they call an arrow at the side. It's a triangle thing. And if you click on that, then you open up a list of all of the states of Mexico. Uh, now, for those of you who are <clears throat> a little more sophisticated about this whole process, you realize that the cataloging process that's done by in libraries and particularly in uh, these large search engines is not infallible. In other words, you may or may not, it's done by people who make judgment calls as to what is, which records go in which category. And so you may find related records to your family in a variety of different locations on the catalog. And that's what makes it fun because then you can try and guess where these records are and uh, see if you can find them, even though that uh, it wasn't, didn't make too much sense. In this case, uh, the listing here <clears throat> are the current states in Mexico. Uh, of course, these states did not always exist. And if we go back far enough in time, 
we go back before there were the, these individual states in the in the country of Mexico. By the way, the name of the, the country of Mexico is the United States of Mexico. So that's, that's uh, just like the United States of America. And so these are the Mexican states. So if we chose one of these states, like Guanajuato, which is a state down in the lower sort of southern part of, of Mexico, we could uh, look there and then we would click on that and Guanajuato would bring it up. And these records would be ones that were found for Guanajuato. Now, kind of to, uh, to, to go back, when, we were, when I was showing all the records for Mexico, that was the, the records which are associated with the, the country. They're countrywide records. What are countrywide records? Censuses uh, in the United States, income tax records in the United States, um, military records. Those are the kinds of things that would be found on the national level. And then you go move down to the state level, what kinds of records are found. Uh, state records could be uh, civil registration, they could be uh, church records of, in some cases, uh, just depending on the area in the United States, a state record would be um, births and deaths. Most of the states now in the United States keep their birth and death records on a state level. So now we're going to move down to a place within the state of Guanajuato, and we click on the arrow again, and we get a listing of, uh, well, we're not getting places within Guanajuato, we're getting the records in Guanajuato. And if we click on the records in, in, uh, for Guanajuato, the church records, we get those registros parochiales antiguas, Diocese de Michoacan in 1670 to 1915, that's the one that's highlighted. And there's other ones, uh, other records here for Guanajuato church records. So as we move through the catalog, we're getting lists of different records. And the important thing to understand is not all these records appear in all of the screens. So if I were to move back up the screen, some of these records would not be there or all of them might not be there. In other words, each record area is a whole new set of records that you need to look at and search. So in this case, we have the uh, records here. And at the top, we have Mexico Guanajuato Catholic Church records, uh, registros parochiales from 1519 to 1984, right up at the top of this list, and some other records. And we also note that they have records from Michoacan. And why do they have the Michoacan records here under Guanajuato? Because historically, it was part of Michoacan. So there's an overlap here, a geographic overlap. And so we're adding a whole nother area of, of what you need to know about working with the catalog and finding the records. And that is you need a little bit of history. You need to know when these states, when these countries, states, uh, counties, parishes, et cetera, were created. So you know whether or not your ancestors' records were, could be found in that area at all. And it's pretty simple to us to understand from the United States. If you look at a historical map of the United States, you'll see uh, the original colonies along the eastern uh, coast of the country. And then as population increased and as there were purchases and wars and things, then um, people moved across until we have 50 states. And we could have 51 or 52 or more in the future if that happened. Uh, or there could be uh, some other combinations of things that could happen. And, and so that's, uh, that history is important also because it makes, it gives a time frame for when these records might be found. <clears throat> now, if we, if we look at these parish records for the, for the Diocese of Michoacan and back in 1670 to 1915, then we will find some general records that, have, that are listed and they're all in big, in family search, they're all in big group and they're in red, they're in the page. But I'm gonna ask you to scroll down on the page when you get into these records because it's important to see 
where the individual records are. And down here at the bottom of this particular page, you'll see there are a list of more records. These are the, these turn out to be individually collections of, of microfilm. They're not all one microfilm roll, but they're all related records that have been grouped together into um, a set of microfilm records. And then down here, for example, we have an alphabetical index of marriages, uh, volumes 376, 1868, 1910, and marriage dispensations, which is a reference to the Catholic Church allowing certain types of marriages between related parties. And then you look over to the side and there's a little camera there. Well, those cameras mean that all those records have been digitized. If it, were, if, it's, if it turned out to look like a little roll of microfilm or a little roll there, it would mean that those records are still on, on, on microfilm. But this camera is the thing. And by clicking on that, you actually can go look at and see the record itself. So there's this record of the, um, of the records from that particular collection of records. And then when you go here, you realize that these records are parish records. They're records from uh, that had listed the births and, and uh, in this case, they are marriage records, but they are um, listed chronologically by parish. So they're listed geographically and chronologically. So after you've worked on identifying your ancestors, the locations where your ancestors lived and the events occurred in their lives, and then you have look at the records, then you are very, very likely to find, uh, especially in a place like Mexico and even in the United States, you'll be, you'll be able to find records that pertain to your particular country, to your particular family, I mean. And so, these are the valuable, this is the value of these records. They're organized in a way that once you learn this organizational method and once you understand and appreciate the catalog, uh, you, you really are not totally dependent on indexes. You don't really have to have an index because all these records are arranged chronologically. And so you can pretty well, once you find one child in a, in a Mexican parish register, there are any Latin speaking from Italy all the way across to Spain and all of Central and South America. Once you find one person's record in, in, the, in a parish, it's very likely that you're going to be able to find everyone else in that particular family, particularly because they didn't move around very much. And so it may be only if not just one parish, you may have a, a series of parishes that are closely related or, or geographically uh, contiguous to each other. But uh, the way of finding these records is, is fairly straightforward once you've got to that point. Now it's straightforward if you read Spanish, if you read the old language, the old handwriting. I mean, there's all sorts of things there that, that uh, depend on. So now we're back here with the microfilms, looking at microfilm. And the process there with looking at the microfilm was a step-by-step -step process. In other words, the same process that I've just outlined for looking and finding the records online on Family Search was exactly the same thing you had to do back then with those microfilm records. Because the microfilms were on rolls, you had to go to the catalog, which when I started was on three by five paper cards and pull the microfilm roll and then you had to put it in the machine and look and search through it to see if their records were pertinent. And then if they were, then you had to go through page by page. Or if you were lucky, there might be an index of some kind or help. But in most cases, you were just searching page by page chronologically. And then when you got to the area where your ancestor was, you were searching line by line until you found the person. So this is, the, this is the process that it worked. Uh, this is really the reason and the motivation, motivation for having people out there doing indexing because by doing an index, then you can pretty well short circuit that whole process. But being the kind of people we are as researchers, 
we don't totally trust any of that. So we're likely to go back to the original record, not likely, but probably every time, go back to the original record and search and verify that the information is actually on the original record. And then if we, once we find that, we, and we know that that's the right person, then that record can be added as a source for our person. And we have one piece, one additional piece of information that will help us find more people. So here, what we're doing is we're going from an original document to microfilm, which was the old way. And then the microfilm and the original documents today are being digitized. So today we're having uh, people out there around the world. Uh, my wife and I spent a year uh, volunteering in Annapolis, Maryland for Family Search and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to uh, uh, digitizing probate records in the Maryland State Archives in Annapolis, Maryland. So uh, this is the kind of book that we did and we took pictures of these books all day and then those pictures will eventually be incorporated into familysearch.org and put up in, into the catalog and be available for people to go through and look. And at some day in the future, if that happens, they will also have people go through this or whatever technology we have in the future and read that handwriting and put all of those people um, into um, the into the uh, index, into an index and be able to more quickly search and find people in this. But they're all there and all the information is there. And that's the good news. Uh, okay, so where are we? There we go. And in ditch, and when you did, when we digitize the records, wait a minute, I gotta go, is there a way to go back? Eek. What? Oh, this, go back here. Okay, there we go. Okay, then the digitized records are added directly to Family Search. So the, these cameras are taking pictures of the records. The records are stored on hard drives. The hard drives are transmitted to Family Search, and Family Search puts those records online. And what we know is coming in the future is that that process is being accelerated, and the goal is that that both records would be put online within a few days of their receipt by Family Search. So it's getting to the point where we may have all this stuff transmitted very quickly. And then this is what they look like. They look like an old microfilm roll, only on a digital, on a piece of paper, a piece of film that's digitized. And then you can zoom in and look at the records individually. So if you're searching in the catalog, when, you get, when you're gonna go look for information, I mentioned, and now this is a additional time to emphasize this, we're searching by place. And then we also have some other options to search by surname. We can, uh, the surname being the, the surname of the individual that we're looking for. Good news, bad news, if I search for Tanners in the Family Search catalog, I'll come up with a couple of hundred thousand people, and that's not real helpful to me because I'm not really related to all those people. Tanner is a occupational surname uh, historically, and a lot of the people with Tanner's surnames, unless they're from the exact same small area, are not related at all. We have the names originated in various parts of the countries. And in, in, in Tanner's uh, name is searched just exactly like that. Uh, began not only in England, but also in Germany and in Switzerland. So there's lots of people that uh, even if their name is Tanner are not, if, are not related. We can look by titles, that's helpful because if you know the name of the microfilm or you know the name of the record, then you can find it very quickly. Uh, you can look by author. Uh, you're not really gonna know the author except you, you might want to look for all the records from a specific archive or from the National Archives or something like that and then that would be helpful. Subjects are helpful in a sense. Um, I don't recall looking for subjects lately. Uh, subject gives too broad because if you look for census records, you're gonna find census records from all over the world. And unless that's what you're just interested in looking at census records. Keywords are helpful. Um, 
if you happen to have a keyword and that would depend on whether or not the, the record had been cataloged with a keyword that you could guess or no. The rest of it down here, call number, uh, is helpful if you happen to know the call number of the book uh, that you're looking for and the reference. And uh, this one is the one that's used all the time, film and fiche number, because when we talk about the microfilm role, the way that you specify a specific role of microfilm is not the title because there might be as many as a hundred roles in, a, in a one set of records and so, or more even. And uh, the microfilm number is the important finding thing. This also helps you to find out if the records have been, uh, are also available in, in the BYU library. And you can mark whether you want them that are any availability or whether they're online or whether they're only available in a family history center. Okay, so here's your list of catalog categories and all of those categories need to be searched including all the records from the place and time of the events in your ancestors' lives. So you just go down the list and you have kind of an endless list for some places of types of records that you can search because of all the different records that your ancestors' names might have appeared in. And you want to always check to see if the records have been indexed and how many have been indexed. So those are the two things you want to know about the indexed records, which are primarily in the historical record collections on family search. So yes, you need to search step by step. You really do need to go one piece at a time in order to, to verify that you found the records. I like it when people come in and say to me that, oh, I've searched everywhere. And I go, yeah, <laughs> I don't believe anything you say. Because searching everywhere really would take a, a, a tremendously long time. But if you understand the system, and you understand how the thing, how the records are organized in the family history catalog and on the other website, major websites, then yeah, you're gonna search everywhere, but you still may not have searched everywhere, but you, you'll have a better chance of finding the information and have uh, and determining whether or not the records actually exist for your uh, particular person. Okay, well, thanks for watching. This uh, concludes another uh, video uh, webinar from families, the families, uh, the BYU Family History Library on the campus of BYU, and remind everyone that the videos are posted to the BYU um, YouTube channel on youtube.com. And thanks again for watching. All right. Thank you, James. We'll now open it up to questions from the audience. So if you have any questions for James, then you can post it in the group chat and we'll have him answer them. Um, the first one says, are there some rules or policies that prevent some films from being digitized or indexed? Um, the answer to that is simply yes. <laughs> There's all sorts of rules. Uh, they begin with the fact that when the, when the films are acquired, there may be restrictions imposed by the original or originator or owner of those films. Uh, so what Family Search goes out and negotiates contracts to do the digitization, and they may have some restrictions. The most common restriction, restricted records that I run into are uh, English parish registers in England. Uh, many of the parishes have uh, allowed Family Search to have their records, but they're only viewable in the Family History Library, or they're only viewable under certain circumstances in the Family History Library. Like you have to look at the records one sheet at a time and give your license, driver's license to the library to hold while you're looking at the records. So there's you know, there's, yeah, there's all sorts of kinds of restrictions that originate with the records. And, and most of those are, uh, if you look in the catalog, and I'm sorry, I didn't give an example of this, but the, uh, they have a little key icon above the um, image, that, the image that shows that there may be some restrictions on those records. Great, thank, thank you, James. Thank you.
Okay. Well, thank you for joining us and we invite you to join us next time on January 22nd, Wednesday at 4 p.m. Um, for Germans in American Church Records with Dr. Roger Minert. Um, and if you have any questions, further questions for James or for us, feel free to email us at FHL underscore webinars at BYU.edu. Um, thank you and have a great day.